Greetings and welcome to Gripping Horror. A diver once compared Cow Springs to a piece of Japanese origami sculpture. At first glance, there does not appear to be that much to it. Yet, as one probes deeper, it keeps unfolding to reveal more and more. There was a fatality here during Memorial Day weekend, 2003. Chris Henson was found in the most challenging section of the cave, called the upstream section solo, with gas in the doubles and a full buddy bottle. Intent on documenting the intricate upstream section, experienced diver Marion M. Koshkosh embarked on the exploration of Cow Springs on January the 6th, 2023. Similarly to Chris, he was diving solo, and unfortunately, similar to Chris, this trip would also end in tragedy. This is the Cow Springs disaster of 2023. Marion Koshkosh was born on December the 21st, 1963, in Glowice, Poland. As the second of six children, Marian grew up in a knit home. From a young age, he had a deep love for adventure. He was an avid backpacker, skier, climber, swimmer, and athlete. He participated in many orienteering events. He loved to travel and visited most of Europe as well as parts of Asia and Africa while in college. However, by the age of 17, he had found his lifelong passion, scuba diving. He joined the Kalmar Scuba Diving Club in his hometown. He dived all across Poland, joining other clubs and becoming closest with Skorpena Diving Club in Olsztyn, Poland. There, he met his future wife, Eva Domaratska. They traveled across Europe together, eventually immigrating to the United States in February 1991 following their wedding. This is where they decided to start their family, pursue their careers, and build a life together. Marian became a physical education teacher, inspiring his students to love athletics for over 20 years at Forest Park School, District 91. Above all, Marian passed on his love for exploration and adventure to his children. As teachers, Marianne and Eva were fortunate to take summer long trips with their children and beloved dog, Coco. Each year, the family set out for a cross-country camping trip, visiting national parks and spending valuable time together. They spent their days kayaking, hiking and swimming. At night, they sat around the campfire, counting stars that stretched out in millions. Each winter, they were joined on ski trips by friends who became family. The group rented a big house, skiing together into the new year. Everyone who knew Marion knew how much he dearly loved his wife and children. He had endless stories to tell of his two sons and daughter, and his greatest pride was being their father. His smile was never bigger than when he was with his family. Throughout these years, scuba diving remained a big part of his life. Marion spent almost every weekend diving. He dived in all, in caves, oceans, rivers, shipwrecks, under ice, and at night. He always added to his collection of equipment and certifications with childlike excitement. With each dive, he fell in love again. Marion had traveled to Florida with a group during the holidays with the purpose of cave diving but he remained in North Florida to continue diving solo when the remainder of the group traveled back home. Marion was a certified and experienced cave diver who was also certified and experienced on the model of closed circuit rebreather he was using during the trip. At some point prior to this dive, while still in the company of the dive group, Marion's rebreather fell from a pickup truck tailgate, damaging the Fisher connector thus preventing the use of the unit's shearwater petrol computer to monitor PO2. PO2, partial pressure of oxygen, reflects the amount of oxygen gas dissolved in the blood. Despite knowing his equipment was faulty, Marion persisted in solo diving, determined to explore Cow Springs on his next dive, scheduled for January the 6th. Many consider Cow Spring to be among the most beautiful of all north-central Florida cave diving sites. 
although no signs mark the way to Cow Spring, it is relatively easy to find, provided you follow directions. A few hundred yards into the woods, the Cow Spring entrance road ends, and you will find parking under the trees near the north side of the sinkhole. The easiest and safest way to enter the water is to take the trail around the sink's left side. This leads to a series of natural stone ledges and steps on the east side of the sinkhole. In years past, access to Cow Spring was available intermittently, as various landowners would, at times, gate or post the property. With the purchase of the site by the National Speleological Society Cave Diving Section, however, access was assured for years to come. The majority of the Cow Spring system was surveyed during the mid-1980s by Wes Skillies, Woody Jasper, Lamar Hires, and Tom Morris. For many years, the upstream side of Cow Spring was accessible only to divers using side-mounted bottles, and only if such divers knew where to find the very obscure spring entrance. That is, until Lamar Hires was walking to the water with a group of cave diving students. As he passed two local open water divers on the trail leading down to the water's edge, he overheard them discuss having reached a depth of 70 feet or 21 meters. Knowing that this was normally impossible, using back mounted cylinders, Lamar offered these two a free cave diving course if they would show him where they had been. As it turned out, these two untrained divers had managed to discover a second entrance to upstream cow, one that had eluded experienced cave divers for years. The discovery of a back-mounted entrance to Cow Spring brought both elation and fear. On the one hand, it meant that nearly any cave diver could now see the very beautiful upstream Cow Passageway, a passageway largely undamaged by the onslaught of divers who visit the area's other popular sites. On the other hand, this very accessibility now put upstream cows' fragile formations in peril. There have been several documented incidents of damage, which are reasons for concern. For these reasons, many cave divers who know how to do so are reluctant to divulge exactly how one gets into upstream cow. Neither the old side mount or new back mount entrance are something divers are likely to find on their own. Therefore, the only way most cave divers are likely to get into upstream cow is to be shown how to do so by another diver who trusts their ability to not cause damage. The upstream entrance to cow springs has a major restriction requiring moderate body and equipment manipulation to pass through a roughly vertical to horizontal transition at about 40 feet of depth. The upstream leg of the cave consists largely of one tunnel although there are a few offshoots that generally go only a short distance or loop back to the main line. Access to upstream of cow should be limited to those with exceptional skills and experience under their belts, as this is an extremely fragile system. Only those with 100 recent post full cave certification dives should even begin to consider diving this site. This is an extremely fragile system divers must ensure their buoyancy control is excellent prior to entering this system as it contains spectacular clay banks and delicate girthite formations throughout that are easily damaged as well as challenging high flow and additional restrictions beyond the entrance. The flow is generally brisk. In fact, between rock stream drop and not my fault, an area with few environmentally sound handholds, there is a polypropylene pull-along line to facilitate getting through a section of cave where it is often impossible to make headway by kicking alone. Depths run in the 60 foot or 18 meter range for the first 300 feet or 90 meters of penetration. Here they drop to the 70 foot or 21 meter range until one reaches not my fault, roughly 700 feet or 210 meters from the entrance. Upstream of not my fault, one encounters depths in excess of 100 feet or 30 meters. Strictly speaking, Cow Spring is not a spring at all, but a sinkhole with both spring and siphon sides. Water flows toward Cow Spring from the northeast, in the same general direction as it does to the neighboring Peacock Orange Grove and Telford systems. From a depth of 70 feet or 21 meters, 
This water wells up through the boulders at the base of the sinkhole's debris cone, then flows into either of the two siphon tunnels on its west side. From here, the water travels another 500 to 600 feet, or 150 to 180 meters, to emerge at two resurgences along the north bank of the Sawani River, which together are known as Running Spring. As yet, no one has successfully made the connection between Cow and Running Springs. Marion arrived at Cow Springs on January the 6th, 2023, for his intended dive. He made an unsafe and ineffective field repair to his rebreather, following the damage to the unit's fissure cable. Unable to repair the broken connector, Marianne reportedly cut the cable and then used a heat shrink wrap over the end of the cut cable in an attempt to waterproof the cable end. After completing his equipment checks, Marion proceeded towards the upstream entrance of Cow Springs. Water leaking under the shrink wrap and the cable being exposed to water caused false readings with his rebreather units. Oxygen sensors, which would have been displayed on the heads-up display. Realizing he was encountering a problem, Marion attempted to bail out, but was only able to close the dive surface valve halfway before the lever became unscrewed, preventing him from fully closing the loop. The model of CCR Marion was using is of the constant mass flow design. Once the valve is open, oxygen will flow until either the valve is closed or the cylinder bleeds dry. Marion began to turn back toward open water as he attempted to deploy the regulator from one bailout cylinder. As he began to turn, the line he was still in the process of laying became tangled around the deployed bailout regulator and his body, preventing him from reaching the deployed second stage. He then attempted to deploy the second stage from his second bailout tank, but either accidentally latched onto the inflator hose rather than the second stage hose, or he was using the inflator hose to pull this bailout cylinder's second stage within reach when he lost consciousness. A bailout procedure should be a fairly simple task, one that is taught and practiced during rebreather training. In this case, Marion had long hoses on both of his bailout regulators, which were secured to the cylinders, and as described above, one regulator became entangled in the guideline during deployment, and the second was not immediately available since the cylinder was no longer bungeed against Marion's body. This is not an uncommon configuration, but the entanglement of his initial bailout regulator and this second regulator being out of reach became an insurmountable problem in the limited available time. If he had at least one of his bailout regulators secured in the triangle formed by his mouth and shoulders, bailout gas would have been immediately available. Also, the fact that the dive surface valve knob came off with the dive surface valve, neither fully opened nor closed, meant going back on the loop was not an option. The following day, on January the 7th, 2023, Marion's van was observed still parked at the site with an O2 bottle and guideline in the spring basin that could be seen from the deck. The Sawani County Sheriff's Office was notified of Marion's disappearance. After calling the Sawani County Sheriff's, the complainant called the International Underwater Cave Rescue and Recovery to advise a diver was suspected lost and deceased due to the length of elapsed time. She also notified the NSS CDS as owners of the site. Upon their arrival, two divers from the IUCRR entered the water to effect a search for Marion, but returned after only a few minutes to advise the victim had been located at the entrance to the upstream cave. As indicated, Marion was diving a CCR unit for which he was trained, but had only a heads-up display to monitor the breathing gas in the loop, since the Fisher connection to a petrol computer was previously damaged. He had two 80 cubic feet aluminium cylinders for bailout. The dive supply valve of Marion's rebreather was in half open, half closed position, and the lever used to open and close the diver's supply valve had become unscrewed and was laying on the cave floor next to his body. Marianne's guideline, which had not yet been tied into the gold line, was loosely wrapped once around his body. Entangled in the line was a deployed 
long hose second stage from one of his bailout cylinders. Marion had a death grip on the inflator hose coming from the first stage of his other bailout cylinder. The regulator second stage was not deployed from this cylinder, but the cylinder was no longer secured in a bungee alongside Marion's body. The inflators on his dry suit and buoyancy control device functioned properly. Both AL80 bailouts were full, as was the victim's dilutant cylinder. The oxygen cylinder on the CCR was empty. Marion's computer showed no movement after 10 minutes following his initial descent. Following the removal of Marion's body with his gear from the water, examination of the cut fissure cable showed the heat shrink wrap over the cut end easily slipped off and water had entered under the wrap and was in contact with the cut cable end. His body was subsequently transported to the medical examiner's office for autopsy, which listed the cause of death as accidental drowning. Following the autopsy and release of the ME's report, the autopsy report was provided to another pathologist without any further information as to the above incident. This review detailed indications that Marion may have suffered from immersion pulmonary edema. If true, this could explain the reason he attempted to bail out. Finally, though solo diving is not uncommon in the cave diving community, due to the redundancy of breathing gas and gear, had he been diving with a buddy, this accident would likely have ended as an incident or near miss, rather than a fatality. Marion had just begun his dive and was still in shallow water and within a three-minute swim to the entry point. A buddy would have likely been able to assist Marion in acquiring one of his bailout regulators or share air with him to make a safe exit or at least get him to the surface in a timely manner to better the chance for his survival. It can be surmised the O2 cylinder on the CCR bled dry during the 24 plus hours Marion was down prior to recovery. Forest Park's elementary school district continued to keep the memory of Marion alive as the faculty and district families gathered to Walker K for Mr. K, approximately five months after his passing, on June the 6th, 2023. He is remembered as a loving husband, a devoted father, a cherished brother. May he rest in peace. Greetings and welcome to Gripping Horror. Font Estramar resembles a complex labyrinth of corridors and dead ends, where losing your way is not an option. Due to the numerous accidents, Font Estramar has a very bad reputation as a killer sinkhole. In 1955, during a television shoot with Garouk Taziev, diver Jean-Claude Guitard lost his way in an annex of the South Gallery and died there before his body was eventually sealed in the cave. This fatal accident justified a temporary ban on diving at Fort Estremar. But the popularity of this Catalan source only continued to grow, and unfortunately, the Black Series continued. These are the Font Estremar disasters. Font Estremar, well known to divers around the world, is the deepest resurgence explored in diving in Europe and the fifth deepest in the world. It was on the initiative of Professor Petit, director of the Arago Laboratory in banyuls sur mer that on August the 27th, 1949, two officers of the 11th BPC, Shock Parachute Battalion, Lieutenant De Pay and Lieutenant George dived into the abyss Equipped with a Cousteau Gagnon autonomous diving apparatus, they dove through an entrance in the form of a porch about four meters below the surface, at the very foot of the cliff which overlooks the basin. From there, they progress into a vertical shaft approximately six meters high, opening into a large, totally submerged room, 14 meters from where two opposing galleries appear to branch off, one towards the south and the other towards the north. Noting that these galleries continue to sink inexorably into the mountain, the divers prefer not to explore further and decide to go back up for lack of more suitable equipment. Followed by the expeditions carried out in 1951 by Cousteau, Taziev and other great divers, several secondary galleries were explored around the main conduit. 
The depth reached in 1955 was 50 meters, the techniques of the time not allowing it to go any lower. In the 1970s, Claude Toulon GM explored a total of 850 meters of galleries in several branches of the network. In 1981, Francis Leguin advanced in the main conduit to the Well of Silence, 410 meters, and explored it down to 58 meters. In 1991, the ARFE, Research Association of Fond Estremar, was created and the depth of 164 meters was reached on August the 15th, 1997, by the Swiss Cyril Brandt. Pascal Barnaby continued to 184 meters on June the 4th, 2006. Jordi Heller, a Catalan diver, descended to 191 meters without finding a continuation of the sump in July 2013. On August the 16th, 2013, Xavier Meniscus, equipped with a double rebreather and helped by a large international team, continued the exploration of the cavity in the giant locum well, located 513 meters from the entrance to a depth of 248 meters, 900 meters from the start, bringing the development of the cavity to approximately 2,900 meters. In July 2015, the same diver, with the help of around 15 team members, pushed back the exploration by around 30 meters to a depth of 262 meters. In June 2019, Xavier Meniscus continued his exploration over a distance of 50 meters horizontally to a depth of 262 meters to reach the lip of a vertical well. After these three explorations, on December the 30th, 2019, Xavier Meniscus descended to 286 meters in the bowels of Fon Estremar at a distance of 1,020 meters from the entrance. On November the 3rd, 2013, Marcel diver Frederick Sharczynski reached the depth of 308 meters, a new world record during a 6.59 hour dive. The abyss itself belongs to a private family of cells. The cliff is the property of the town hall. The municipality, like the owners, has installed prohibition signs. Prohibition of diving and swimming for the municipality. Several meetings have already been organized on the safety of the premises, but divers associations demand that it remain accessible and open. Specialized firefighters, especially from the Ord, state that it is important that they can train on this type of site that it can save lives during future interventions. These discussions and contrasting views on access all began after the town experienced a pivotal moment in the summer of 1955. In the summer of 1955, excitement rippled through the coastal town of South Le Chateau as Commander Jacques Cousteau's iconic boat, Lily Monnier, graced their shores. Eager to showcase the marvels of Fonda Estrema, a group of intrepid explorers, including Dumas and his brother Jean-Claude Gutier, eagerly awaited the commander's visit. Unlike the commander's first visit in 1951, on this trip they planned to create a film about the cave, as Gurak Tassif had a film about groundwater to be finished, and the Gutier brothers told him about the magnificent resurgence of Fonda Estrema, which they so loved. The first shot is going very well. Gurek Tazioff is delighted, but had to ascend with Dumas to recharge his camera. Meanwhile, Jacques, Jean-Claude and another diver by the name of Kasharu plan to take a look at a new gallery, discovered a few tens of meters from the basin. After some time passed, only two divers emerged, and Jean-Claude was not one of them. Still in shock, Jacques explained what happened to Dumas and Gurok. The three divers followed each other in this new gallery for a few meters, and then they turned the dive and planned to return. But, unexpectedly, a wall of brown water advanced towards them. In the split of a second, they couldn't see anything anymore. While all the galleries are crystal clear, the bottom of it is covered with a powdery silt that the gallery they were in succumbed to. 
It was at this point that Jean-Claude became separated from the group. Dumas knew that his brother only had a few minutes of life left, so he hastily grabbed his diving gear and prepared to descend. Gurag Terziev tried to stop him, but nothing nor anyone could stop Dumas from going back down to look for his brother. The always extraordinary visibility had become equal to zero. Dumas went down as much as the lifeline permitted. He had to find Jean very quickly under the penalty of death, but he couldn't see anything. After a very long, terrible moment, Dumas turned towards the exit and the light. There's nothing more he could do. There was a very low chance that Jean had reached a pocket of air and was waiting there in the dark for rescue. Dumas would have to give his parents the hardest phone call of his life. After the accident, Dumas went to see Cousteau in Paris, who sent his great team from Marcel to continue the search for Jean, but to no avail leading to the heartbreaking decision to cease any further attempts. It is only three years after the incident, a great diver friend of Dumas, Mr. Bono, found Jean by chance. He was stuck in a chimney, almost invisible near the exit, located at a depth of seven meters. Due to the position and difficulty which Jean's body was stuck, it was deemed unsafe to try and execute a body recovery operation. Dumas's friend Galeron and his underwater works company, Sogetram, blocked the entrance to the gallery at Damas' request. Jean-Claude, one of the fingers of my hand, my brother, with whom I shared everything for 23 years. He entered the basin and I never saw him again. How is it possible? I try every day to remember his voice, his laughter. Rest there, Jean-Claude, in this chasm that you loved. On May the 27th, 2008, tragedy would once again cast its shadow over Fonda Estrema. The weather, though turbulent during days that built up to this tragedy, hinted at the possibility of reckless risk-taking as the cause of the calamity. Yet, the truth proved far more harrowing. A duo of Czech divers, their identities which have never been revealed to the public, embarked on a fateful journey into the depths of the Estrema chasm. Only one of the divers emerged from the abyss, leaving behind many unanswered questions and a sense of profound loss for his buddy. It was reported that one of the divers, aged 33, succumbed to discomfort over a hundred meters from the cave's entrance, leaving his 43-year-old dive buddy to grapple with the grim reality below. Despite valiant efforts to rescue his stricken comrade, the depths claimed their toll forcing the surviving diver to make a gut-wrenching decision. With a heavy heart and dwindling hope, he detached the lifeline that bound them together, leaving his buddy's lifeless body behind as he ascended to seek aid. The diver went up safe and sound, but too quickly. He was immediately transported to the hyperbaric chamber of the Saint-Pierre Clinic, but thankfully he never succumbed to any serious injuries. The alarm was raised at 3.11 p.m. and emergency responders swiftly mobilized. But the bad weather recorded for 48 hours made the rescuers think. Knowing that the level of the river, Le Verdouble, had risen by 50 centimeters and that it is connected to the abyss by underground tracks, those responsible for the rescue on site believed that attempting a body recovery at 6 p.m. represented a real danger. The scuba dive of the Spelio Secure Francois team started at 10.35 p.m., which lasted 40 minutes. Amidst treacherous weather conditions and rising waters, firefighters and gendarmes coordinated a rescue operation fraught with peril. As the river Le Vaudouble surged, threatening to engulf the abyss below, divers from the Orillon Sainte Marie in the Pyrenees Atlantique braved the depths to retrieve the fallen diver's body. The two divers found the lifeless body of the victim 135 meters from the entrance at a depth of 36 meters between two boulders with his regulator out of his mouth. In the somber aftermath, questions lingered and hearts weighed heavy with sorrow. 
Amidst the chaos and grief, an investigation unfolded. The details emerged slowly, revealing the grim reality of a recreational dive turned tragic, but the specific details of this incident was never revealed to the public. It was speculated this was done to protect the image of Font Estrema, as not to hurt its appeal to divers around Europe. As condolences poured in from all corners, the family, friends, and loved ones of the fallen diver grappled with the harsh reality of their loss. Just four years later, Font Estremar found itself thrust into the spotlight once again. On this occasion, the victim was 52-year-old Jean-Luc Amango, a fisherman and dedicated volunteer firefighter from Garisson, who was known for his unwavering commitment to his community and his passion for exploration. Affectionately dubbed Rambo for his impressive physical prowess, Jean-Luc was revered for his technical skill and his intimate knowledge of the natural world. From the practice of caving, he had done it as more than a hobby and had specialised in the exploration of underground galleries in the Clab. This is how he rendered countless services to Grousson, exploring caves and cavities, but also guts in search of sources. As a stalwart member of the Reconnaissance and Intervention Group, in perilous environments, Grimp and the Speedio Secure Francois, SSF, Jean-Luc had spent two decades serving on the front lines of rescue missions and exploration efforts and had reached the rank of Chief Corporal. Jean was a man who deepened everything that interested him. He also chaired another association, the Grassinois Military Heritage, for which he was looking for museum pieces. He was working to preserve and renovate the blockhouses of the Second World War on the territory of the municipality. His loss was deeply felt not only by his fellow firefighters, but also by the entire village of Grousson, where his impact extended far beyond his roles as a firefighter and fisherman. Jean-Luc's passion for exploration led him to delve into the depths of Font Estrema on a fateful night dive on Friday, May the 25th, 2012. It was a dive he had undertaken solo many times before, but on this occasion, tragedy struck. His companion raised the alarm when Jean-Luc failed to resurface, triggering a frantic search by the firefighters' divers' brigade. Sadly, Jean-Luc's lifeless body was discovered just meters from the chasm's exit, sending shockwaves through the tight-knit community of Grousson. As authorities launched an investigation to unravel the circumstances of his untimely demise, two major hypotheses emerged. Either a sudden medical emergency had incapacitated Jean-Luc, or a mechanical malfunction had compromised his rebreather. Amidst the grief and speculation, one thing remained certain. Jean-Luc Omegaard's legacy as a fearless explorer and dedicated community servant would endure leaving an indelible mark on the hearts of all who knew him. Jean-Luc was a very human person, expressed with emotion Major Roland Gerard in charge of the Grimp. He was very attached to human values and the homeland. He was an excellent teammate, and as a speediologist, he handled the ropes with great technicality. Jean-Luc had a very fine knowledge of the natural environment and we counted on him with our eyes closed. Jean-Luc Armengard is survived by his two children, aged 28 and 32, who continue to keep his legacy alive. Four years passed before Fond Estremar claimed yet another life. The victim, a 50-year-old diver from Sete, Hero, met his untimely demise during an exploration of the cave on January the 23rd. 2016. Details surrounding the incident were scarce, mirroring the veil of secrecy that had resembled previous tragedies at Fonda Estrema. The diver's identity remained concealed from the public, adding to the enigma surrounding the chasm's waters. The victim's diving buddy came to the surface to alert the rescuers before he was placed in a hyperbaric chamber. The divers of CODIS 66 recovered the diver in cardiorespiratory arrest. Despite all their efforts, they were unable to revive him 
and the diver died on the spot. At the time of the diving incident, the victim was in the well of the draperies, not far from the exit, at a depth of 30 meters. The divers were equipped with two 10-liter bottles of compressed air, which meant that they did not want to venture very far into the cave. One year later, Font Estremar would have its fifth fatality. During the summer of 2017, a team of five cave divers from Finland traveled to southern France for a cave diving holiday. The plan was to spend two weeks in the region and dive caves that they had been diving already before. From June the 9th to the 10th, the plan was to dive Font Estremar. The first dive day was a setup day where all safety tanks were installed to the cave and check up for the conditions of the water and line system. The second day was supposed to be the deep dive to approximately 200 meters depth. The team consisted of two deep divers, two support divers, and one person who would wait on the surface. On the setup dive on the morning of Friday, June the 9th, 2017, the maximum depth was 160 meters for the deep team and 70 meters for the support team. A total of 20 safety tanks were installed to various depths for the next day. Water conditions were good, clear visibility and 18 degrees Celsius temperature. After the dive, the teams rested and started to prepare for the next day. On Saturday, June 10th, 2017, the deep diving team which consisted of divers 1 and 2 started their descent approximately at 9 a.m. During the descent, they installed an additional backup rebreather to 100 meters. When they arrived at 200 meters depth, Diver 1 heard a loud noise behind him. When turning around, he saw that the scooter of Diver 2 had imploded and was dragging Diver 2 deeper. The scooter was attached to the diver with a pulling cord and a clip. Diver 2 was not able to release the negative scooter and was trying aggressively to swim up. Diver 1 swam after him to help and was able to cut the towing cord in 214 meter depth and they stopped descending. The imploded scooter continued to descend. Visibility was very bad during this event and the divers had to look for the lost guideline. During their search they found themselves in a dead end. After a quick search Diver 1 found the guideline and was able to help Diver 2 also to the line. But Diver 2 had already suffered from reduced ability to work. Soon the situation escalated when Diver 2 got stuck in the loose guidelines. Diver 1 tried to cut the guidelines and told Diver 2 to calm down, but he was already suffering from reduced level of consciousness and very soon he went unconscious. Diver 1 could not do any more to help his friend and was forced to leave in order to save himself. Diver 1 started his decompression from 130 meters and the total deco time was 450 minutes at this point. Safety divers started their dive 100 minutes after the dive team started and when meeting Diver 1, they received the information what had happened. Diver 1 was escorted to shallow water and kept under a surveillance during the decompression. Message about the accident was brought up and Diver 5 the surface person made the emergency call. The police and fire department arrived before Diver 1 was surfaced and the fire department divers took the safety diver responsibility for the rest of the decompression. Diver 1 finally surfaced after 500 minutes of dive time in good physical health. The team hired by the SSF under judicial requisition completed its mission on June the 18th, 2017. Frederick Szarczynski reached a depth of 234 meters in Font Estrema to find the body of the missing diver. He made a video and recovered the victim's computer, which he handed over to the judicial authorities. The operation lasted four days, during which time the cave was equipped with a safety line dimensioned for the planned dives. When asked about the feasibility of recovering the body, None of those involved said it was feasible without excessive risk. One year later, Font Estremar claimed yet another unfortunate soul. 
adding another tragic chapter to its publicized history of death. Mark Schwarzschnee, born in Antwerp, February 1, 1962, was an adventurer, sportsman, keynote speaker, mental coach and author. Through extreme sports, he searched to overcome his mental and physical boundaries. He broke several records, including for swimming across the English Channel, sky jumping from a balloon, climbing the Annapurna without an oxygen mask and gliding above the Andes, and participated many times in the European and World Championships in different disciplines. During the last few years, Mark focused on coaching executive teams and high-level athletes. Mark Schwarzschnee had also been a member of the Belgian Davis Cup tennis team and was also an accomplished fencer. During his dive, which took place on June the 28th, 2018, Mark and his buddy got separated when their buddy line broke at 125 meters depth in the vertical gallery. Poet de Locum. His buddy, Dennis Kozlow, could reach the surface. He didn't. The dive was preceded by two preparation days the route preparation, bailout and decompression station preparation. The dive took place on an open cycle, using diver propulsion vehicles. The dive involved 16 cylinders and three diver propulsion vehicles and dry suits. Bottom gas, Trimix 960 stage and bailout gases, Trimix 2030, EAN 32, deco gases EAN 50, EAN 80, EAN 100. The maximum permissible depth was planned at 125 meters, the estimated maximum distance of 550 meters from the entrance. At the final stage of the dive in the vertical gallery, Puy de Locum, 23 to 25 minutes after their initial descent at depth 100 meters, Mark ignored the breakage of the main line and did not responding on the signals continued descent to a depth of 114 to 117 meters, where the gallery does a sharp turn. This point was the last place of visual contact with Mark. Primary search and rescue lasted until 3 a.m. the next day, but unfortunately did not bring any results. The repeated search operation began at the request of the Prosecutor of the Republic on July the 9th, 2018. The initial decision was to not organize a search for Mark because of risks, and the family agreed. But then the authorities decided to send a search party, which led to another death. On June the 9th, 2018, at 8 a.m., began a search operation consisting of 16 people and unit Speedio Secure Francois on the detection and lifting of the body of Mark Schwozny. During the preparatory work and search in the Park Zebra area, Rescuer Lauren Richau failed to resurface. The operation had started well, with the first dive of recognition by the pair of divers who visited the side galleries on the network. However, there was an incident during the return of the mission, at the time that the divers emerged from the resurgence. Lauren Richau's body was rushed to the surface by his dive partner. Lauren died while trying to shoot a video on the state of the emergency. Besides the provided facts, no further information, such as the cause of Laurent's untimely passing, was ever released. According to the friends of NSS CDS instructors, Mark was completely unprepared for such dives. Yes, he was extreme, but such dives require global training. It would not be until September the 3rd, 2018, that Mark's body was retrieved from the cave bringing closure to his family and friends. Deceived by a few quiet years instant free, the public dared to believe that Font Estremar's dark history had reached its conclusion. However, disaster struck once more, claiming its most recent victim to date on July the 19th, 2023. Engineer by profession, living in the clermont ferrand in the Pointe de Dorme, Dominic Azam was also a very experienced diver. He was an emeritus diver who had been part of Luke Long's team for about 10 years, an underwater archaeologist who, in 2008, discovered one of the only busts of Julius Caesar carved during his lifetime, immersed in the Rhone. 
Beyond his professional qualities, he was a very endearing person. A big kid, pleasant and helpful. Dom had a handicap, but he did not let it limit him. Dominique suffered from deafness, so in diving he was his happiest. Underwater, his team all communicate by signs. It compensated. On Wednesday, July the 19th, 2023, Dominique arrived at Font Estremar with his dive buddy. After their bottom time, Dominique reportedly had a heart attack during the ascent. Despite the care of the friend who accompanied him, then help, he unfortunately did not survive. Font Estremar stands as a paradox, a captivating abyss that has both lured explorers with its beauty and claimed lives with its treacherous depths. From the early days of Commander Cousteau's exploration to the recent tragedies that befell daring divers, Font Estremar remains a mystery that has left the cave diving community with more questions than answers. May all the victims rest in peace. The island of Cozumel, known as Mexico's crown jewel, is a glistening tropical paradise, famous for its lush greenery, white sandy beaches, and warm blue waters. It is ranked among the world's top diving destinations, attracting thousands of visitors annually. Amongst these was the English pop star and songwriter Kirsty McCall, who, like many celebrities, enjoyed the island for its laid-back atmosphere. In 2000, Kirsty began working with the BBC on an eight-part radio documentary series on Cuban music and culture. As it was very clear from her music that she has a passion for the music scene in Latin America. The series was recorded in Havana, the capital of Cuba, and featured Kirsty interviewing some of the most famous Cuban musicians, including some members of the Bonavista Social Club. Later, in December 2000, after 18 months of non-stop filming, Kirsty needed a long overdue break. Passionate about water sports, she chose Cozumel. This trip, her third, would be especially enjoyable since she planned to introduce her sons, Jamie, 15, and Louis, 13, to scuba diving. It would certainly be a holiday to remember, but in the worst possible way imaginable. Cozumel is an island off the east coast of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, with its economy based mostly around tourism. One of the main reasons that people visit the Cozumel is to go scuba diving or snorkeling, as it boasts one of the most diverse coral reefs, the second largest in the world, that is home to over 1,000 species. On December the 11th, 2000, Kirsty, her boyfriend, musician James Knight, and two sons flew out to Cozumel, Mexico, due to return on December the 20th, just before Christmas. On December the 18th, around 2 p.m., two days before they were due to return home, Kirsty and her sons headed out to the Chunganar Reef, a 67,000-acre designated diving area, protected by the National Maritime Park of Cozumel since 1996. The area is extremely popular among tourists, restricted to only access to swimmers, divers and their dive boats, with a speed limit of 4 knots which is equivalent to about 4 miles per hour on land. Kirsty's boyfriend, James, chose to spend his day relaxing at their rented villa. Kirsty and her two sons head out to a boat called the Scuba Shack, led by an experienced dive master of 30 years, Ivan Diaz. About 300 metres offshore, the group stopped above the reef and began their first dive. All in all, the diving part went rather well. They explore the beautiful marine life the reef has to offer, even going down to the famous 14-foot underwater statues, the Christ, Chakmal, Mayan God of Rain, and the Virgin Mary. Certified divers also had the option to be led into a cave, named La Quebrada. This is the only cave you can dive through from the shore in Cozumel. Kirsty had been scuba diving many times before, but neither her and her two sons had the experience needed for the cave, so they stuck to the Chunkanam Reef. Kirsty's son seemed to enjoy it as much as Kirsty did, although Louis, her younger son, later said that something felt off the entire day, an ominous sense of dread he just could not shake. When the family rose to the surface after completing their 30-minute dive, the dive master Ivan noticed something was amiss. About a quarter of a mile away, heading straight towards them at high speed, was a 31-foot motorboat called the Percolito and showed no signs of stopping. 
Ivan in complete shock, thinking to himself that surely the boat's captain would see the divers and swerve to avoid them, or at least try and slow down. He started waving his arms and began yelling for the boat to stop, but there was no one up front looking out. Kirsty turned and noticed the boat heading towards her eldest son, Jamie. It was travelling so fast that its prow was raised high out of the water. There was no way the driver would have seen Jamie in time. Kirsty swam forward and pushed her son out of the boat's path, shouting for him to look out. The boat slammed through the group, hitting the dive master Ivan in the chest and injuring Jamie. There was a loud crack as the boat's propeller hit Kirsty's diving equipment and the sea began to turn an opaque red with her blood. Ivan then quickly ushered the two boys back on the boat, urging them not to look behind them. The two children saw, however, the worst thing they could possibly see. Kirsty's body, floating face down in the water, practically chopped in half by the boat's powerful propellers. Louis recalls, on the first dive, about 2pm, we all went down together. There were wonderful things there. I came up to the surface first. Mummy was next to me. I said, wow. She smiled and said, great. Then she suddenly screamed, look out, and tried to push us out of the way. The boat was already over us. I could see the propellers. I was swimming in Mummy's blood. I heard Jamie shout, where's Mummy? I screamed that she'd been hit and to swim the other way and not look back. The boat, Percolito, did not stop. It drove another 300 feet until it was forced to come to a halt due to the damage sustained when Kirsty's diving equipment bent a metal bar that impeded the propeller's action. A captain of a nearby diver boat called the Nazareno, who witnessed the entire accident and did his best to maneuver his boat into the path of the Percolito, went over to the Percolito and demanded to know why they were on the reef. The captain replied, I didn't see any boys. Ivan and the two boys were in a state of shock, unable to move and to speak. The captain of the Nazarino, Philip Put, radioed the port captain, requesting an ambulance, but he knew it would be no use. Kirsty was already dead. Those on the Percolito never made any attempts to help. They stayed around 15 yards away from the scene, watching on the whole time. When the paramedics arrived, the scene was reportedly so gruesome that one of the operators threw up at the site. Two later autopsy reports, one performed in Mexico and one in London, revealed that Kirsty had practically been sliced in half from the back of her neck all the way down to her waist, with parts of her left leg and chest severed. James, still back at the villa, was called and informed there had been an accident, but little other information was given to him. When he headed down to the Playa Corona, the beach Kirsty's body had been brought onto, still no information had been given to him. It was left to Kirsty's two teenage sons to inform Jamie of the tragic accident. When the police arrived at Playa Corona, they spoke to those on board the Percolito as well as Ivan Diaz. Ivan later recalled the police officers asking those on board the Percolito who was driving the boat, who was in charge of the boat. One man responded, I am, I am the owner of the boat and was the one who was driving at the time of the accident. This man was 67 year old, Gomea Gonzalez Nova, who was at the time Mexico's seventh richest person. He was the chairman of a company called Controladora Commercial Mexicana, Mexico's second largest food retailer at the time. Gonzalez Nova had a holiday home in Cozumel for nearly 40 years, so he would have been well aware of the restrictions placed around that area of the reef. On board the boat was Gonzalez Nova, his two sons, his daughter-in-law, his 10-month-old granddaughter, and a 26-year-old boat hand called Jose Sanyam. Police led Gonzalez and his family away for questioning. Within hours of the accident, Gonzalez Nova's lawyer had flown in from Mexico City and they made sure that the family was first to give their witness statements, leaving many other key witnesses, including Ivan Diaz, waiting for days to give their statements. Felipe Put, the captain of the Nazarano, later stated that it wasn't until eight days after the accident that he was asked to come in and give his statement. Despite the fact that he had been a key witness and the man that had called it in, Ivan was questioned for three days until his statement was completed. Although he later claimed that, initially, police had given him a blank piece of paper and asked him to sign it, saying they would fill in the rest later. Ivan refused 
saying he was not going to put his name on a piece of paper before knowing exactly what he was agreeing to. Hours after the accident, and despite the fact that many witnesses overheard Gonzalez Nova claim that he had been the one driving the boat at the time of the accident, someone else came forward to say they were responsible. The boat hand, Jose Senyum. Senyum claimed that he was only driving at about one knot or approximately one mile per hour, but he didn't see any trace of divers or dive boats at the scene and that he was under the impression that they were not in an area of the Chunkanar Reef that they were much further out to sea. Not only this, but he claimed that after only 10 minutes had another boat arrived on the scene of the accident. This was a lie, as well as the scuba shack, the boat that Kirsty and her sons had gone out on that day. There were two other dive boats in the area, the Nazareno and the Bongulus, both about 160 feet away from the accident. Not only this, but Kirsty would never have taken her two children out to the coral reefs that were further out to sea, as it was just too dangerous for beginner divers. The reefs further out to sea are about 3,000 feet deep and are notoriously unsafe for beginner divers, whereas the Chankana Reef is only about 150 feet deep and is a very popular place for newbie divers and tourists. Gonzalez Nova claimed in his statement that they were about 400 meters away from the Chankanab Reef when they hit Kirsty, but he also claimed that the Red Cross had removed Kirsty and taken her to a jetty around 400 meters away. In fact, if Kirsty and her family would have been 400 meters away from the Chankanab Reef, then the distance from where they were to the jetty would have actually been about 700 meters, as the Chankanab Reef is 300 meters from the jetty. To give you a better idea, as can be seen on this map, just how close the designated diving area is to the shore. Therefore, they would have definitely been closer to the shore when they hit Kirsty than they claimed that they were, because Kirsty could not have been that far out to sea if this is the designated diving area. And not only this, but many witnesses contradicted the family statement that they had only been going at around one knot when they hit Kirsty. Those on the nearby boats, Kirsty's sons, as well as locals who witnessed the accident, claimed that the boat was actually travelling at around 20 knots. Had the Percolito actually been driving at one knot, then it would have taken 18 whole seconds to go through Kirsty's group, giving them plenty of time to swim out of the way. Despite all the evidence to the contrary, Jose Sanyam was arrested and released on a $9,000 bail and then sent to trial in 2002. The trial did not have a jury, but apparently this is not uncommon in Mexico. The trial also conveniently omitted a lot of crucial evidence that directly contradicted the family statements and many locals were afraid to come forward due to the power Gonzalez possessed in the area. Senyam was convicted of culpable homicide and was sentenced to almost three years in prison. However, in Mexico, you can pay your way out of your jail sentence if your jail sentence is less than five years prison time by paying one peso for every day you would have been imprisoned. So, in March of 2003, he was released from jail after paying $91 to avoid serving the three-year prison term that had been handed down to him. This is a story of an incredible miscarriage of justice. A Christmas getaway of laughter and joy turned into a tragedy. The case was deliberately fast-tracked and received no publicity in Mexico in order to maintain Cozumel's lucrative tourist industry. McColl's death may have been unjustly swept under the rug, but it would be impossible to do the same to her legacy. In 2001, a bench was placed at the southern entrance of London's Soho Square in memory of Kirsty McColl. In light of the lyrics to her song, Soho Square, one day I'll be waiting there. No empty bench in Soho Square. This accident was nothing short of a nightmare. A diver trapped in the depths of an old, murky well in Le Crescenta. His safety rope tangled beyond repair as he struggled to catch a breath. However, what makes this tragedy all the more mind-boggling is that it happened to none other than Paul Francis Hayden himself. Buckle up and get ready to hear the unbelievable story of Paul Hayden. Meet Paul Francis Hayden a highly trained member of the U.S. Air Force's elite para-rescue unit. Paul, now 39 years old, 
has braved some of the toughest conditions a person can bear. From diving into rough seas to rescuing fishermen in dire straits, he had done it all. Joining the Air Force's equivalent of the Navy SEALs in 1986, Hayden had earned a reputation as a careful and reserved instructor who placed the safety of his comrades above all else. His commanding officer, Colonel Kent Clark, couldn't understand what could have possibly gone wrong, as Hayden was not one to take unnecessary risks. Paul was not a thrill seeker. He was extremely careful. He was always very conscientious about inspecting his equipment and took care of the people with him. I just can't figure out what went wrong. Goss Canyon is a hidden gem, known only to a select few and cherished by those lucky enough to stumble upon it. Nestled within the craggy, granite walls at the top of the canyon lies an abandoned well, blown out of the mountainside back in 1907. It was this well that caught the eye of Hayden and his six siblings who grew up in Le Crescenta. The Hayden siblings quickly transformed the well into their very own summer oasis, using it as a spot to swim, dive, and explore the labyrinth of tunnels and caverns that reached hundreds of feet below the surface. For the Hayden siblings, this well was more than just a place to cool off during the scorching summer months. It was a world of adventure waiting to be discovered. The morning of September the 17th, 2000, found Air Force Master Sergeant Paul Hayden and his older brother Michael embarking on a journey deep into the rugged terrain of Goss Canyon. Laden with scuba gear, the brothers set out to explore the old horizontal water well that Paul had known so well since childhood. As a US Air Force para-rescue instructor, Paul was determined to push the boundaries and explore further than he had ever done before, surpassing sumps that plunged hundreds of feet deep. Despite his years of experience, it's worth noting that Paul had never undergone any form of cave diving training or certification. Still, that didn't deter him from delving deeper into the well. With his brother by his side, Paul set out on what would be his most challenging dive in the well yet. After receiving permission from Mrs. Pruitt, the current owner of the well, the Hayden brothers unlocked the heavily fortified gate leading to the well. It's worth noting that Mrs. Pruitt had repeatedly cautioned against visitors due to liability concerns, recognizing the inherent dangers of exploring abandoned mines and wells. These sites pose a greater risk of collapse, as well as the potential presence of toxic gases and low oxygen levels, making it imperative to use atmospheric monitors during exploration. Despite these warnings, the Hayden brothers forged ahead with their plan. With no regard for the potential hazards that lay ahead, they stepped into the murky depths, determined to explore every nook and cranny. But little did they know, their journey would take a dark and tragic turn. Taking every possible safety precaution, the Hayden brothers tethered themselves together with a sturdy rope before embarking on their exploration of the well. With all their checks in place, they began their journey by crawling through the narrow, three by four foot opening, equipped with air tanks and lights to guide their way. After crawling for about 50 meters through the tunnel, they descended down a slope, covering another nine meters to reach a water-filled room. It was a moment of excitement and anticipation as they prepared to plunge deeper into the well, eager to uncover what lay ahead. Sensing the potential danger ahead, Michael decided to remain at the water's edge, holding one end of the thin retrieval line as a guideline, while Paul continued his descent with scuba gear. Armed with a waterproof video camera as his primary light source, Paul communicated to his brother that he had two hours of air and instructed him to seek help if he failed to return within that time. The dive plan seemed to be progressing without any issues as Paul swam deeper into the well, exploring the caverns hidden beneath its surface. However, within just 15 minutes of diving, 
everything suddenly took a turn for the worse. As Paul descended further into the murky depths of the well, the water grew increasingly cold and siltier. It was then the disaster struck. Paul's safety rope became hopelessly tangled while he was squeezed into one of the narrow tunnels. Panic began to set in as the gravity of the situation slowly dawned on him. He was trapped in freezing, silty water with no escape in sight. In a state of utter panic, Michael tried with all his might to pull his trapped brother out, but to no avail. Realising that he couldn't move the tangled rope any further, Michael made a quick decision to rush back up the opening of the well to seek help for his younger brother. Without wasting any more time, Michael frantically made his way to the nearby Le Crescenta Sheriff's Office to request urgent assistance for Paul. His heart racing with fear and anxiety, he desperately hoped that someone would be able to help his little brother before it was too late. At 1.20pm, Michael burst through the doors of the Crescenta Valley Sheriff Station, pleading for assistance. Sheriff divers responded and soon rescued personnel from several agencies using four-wheel drive vehicles to traverse the old, treacherous dirt road, arrived outside the well entrance. First to arrive was the LA County Sheriff's Department, including the Montrose Search and Rescue Team, quickly followed by the LA County Fire Department. They found a chaotic scene. Michael was frantically trying to calm himself down, while family and friends of Paul were waiting anxiously for news. The team quickly assessed the situation and began their rescue attempt. Mark Lonsdales, a training officer of the LA Sheriff's dive team and a nationally known cave and mine rescue diver certified by the NSS Cave Diving Section main objective, was to locate and assess the condition of Paul Hayden but the conditions inside the well were changing, with silt reducing visibility to almost zero and the passageways narrow and constricting. About 150 feet beyond the water's edge, they found an old ceiling collapse had partially blocked the tunnel, forming a dam which flooded the area beyond. Several ventilation fans were installed to increase the oxygen level to an acceptable range. Mark entered the sump, occasionally passing through air pockets About 185 feet into the flooded section and over 400 feet from the entrance, Lonsdale found Sergeant Hayden's body in a long, partially water-filled passage. His head was underwater and the regulator was out of his mouth. His scuba tanks were nearly full. Lonsdale fortunately resisted the temptation to move his own regulator. Subsequent samples from the airspace showed only 4% oxygen Normal air contains 21% oxygen. Breathing air containing 50% oxygen will cause dizziness and headaches, and air containing 9% oxygen will cause unconsciousness. Breathing air with 7% or less oxygen will cause the required oxygen supply to the brain to be immediately shut off, a condition known as asphyxia. A condition Paul unfortunately succumbed to. As Paul struggled to free himself from the tangled rope in the cold, silt-filled water, his panic grew. But then he spotted the air pocket and quickly swam towards it in his increasingly disorientated state, thinking it was his saviour. Little did he know that pocket of air would seal his fate. The one-metre diameter tunnel Paul's body was pulled from was directly below a gas pocket. The shocking discovery was revealed through the recovered footage from Paul's camera. It showed Paul poking his head into the gas pocket and removing his regulator, only to then fall to the bottom of the tunnel and remain motionless. The cause of death was determined to be a lack of oxygen or an excess of some other deadly gas in the air pocket. It's a haunting reminder of the dangers of exploring such environments and the importance of following safety protocols. In fact, it was reported that Hayden had agreed with his para-rescue co-workers prior to the trip that he should never remove his regulator. Yet, in a moment of panic or curiosity, he did, resulting in a small mistake with fatal consequences. While it's important to learn from these tragedies, 
It's also important to remember that cave diving can be done safely with proper training, equipment, and adherence to safety protocols. Paul's story stands as a reminder to always prioritize safety and caution when exploring the underwater world. Rest in peace, Paul. This has been gripping horror. Until next time, dive safe.